Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Trans 101, featuring Tara. Tara is a freelance artist, writer, and podcaster residing in Portland, Oregon. I have known them since 2007, when I was an urban farmer living in their backyard. They are on Twitter as CyberSatyr. In our conversation, we discussed how new ideas fit in with old ones, the phrase, trans women are women, the concept of misgendering, how quickly the discussion of gender has been changing, trans people in the military, the term TERF, the usage of they, them, the word transsexual, trans athletes in sports, actors, acting, and Hollywood, and the importance of accepting things even when you don't understand them. If you like this episode, please share it on social media. That really helps. To support this work financially, you can make a one-time donation to username Colibri at paypal.me or at Venmo. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. You can also become a member at patreon.com slash Colibri. We all get early access to new episodes, exclusive digital content, and goodies mailed to you. This introductory music is by Dr. Dreamchip, an electronic music artist in Portland, Oregon. See show notes for how to follow their work. Now here is Tara with Trans 101. So, Tara, I'm really happy to welcome you to the podcast. Thank you uh, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you're here. And today we're going to talk about, uh, I had the idea of calling this one Trans 101, just uh, uh, if, if that's um, an accurate way to, to, to put it. or um... That is a way that it is uh, oftentimes described. Um, right. When, when, when talking about uh, transgender issues, it's usually filed under Trans 101. You can find a lot of information simply by searching that in your search engine. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. And, and well, and, you know, speaking of search engines, what I found is that for me personally, anyway, this is a topic that I don't feel like just Googling it does me much good. I feel like I've needed to have conversations, you know, with people mm -hmm. and hear directly from people. And sometimes that can be you know, watching something on YouTube or, or hearing a podcast or something like that. But I feel like the results from, from Google are far too random and odd uh, mm -hmm. for me personally for a topic like this. So that's partly why I'm, you know, real happy to have you on the show here today so that we can, you know, present something like that too. And then I also just wanted to stress that this isn't um, uh, like an interview in the sense of like me putting you under the microscope and being like, okay, you and what do you think? And what do you, but, but, but that for me, I'm also wanting to hear about these things. Um, my own, like back in the late eighties, early nineties, um, when I was in college, the uh, college I was at didn't have a gay lesbian group at it yet, you know? Hmm. And so me and my friends helped to, to start one and um, it's still there today, which is, you know, still one of my um, prouder accomplishments actually. Um, but back in those days, we used the word gay, we used the word lesbian, and bi was kind of a joke, you know, from, yeah. from both sides, you know what I mean? It still is yeah. in some circles, although it's more respectful now. But um, so, so anyway, things have really changed since then, you know, like, mm -hmm. since then, when I was trying to figure myself out, just in the context of like, these two or three words, you know, and so I look yeah. at this uh, increased vocabulary, and all this new talk that's going on, and I'm like, oh, well, you know, there's all sorts of things I felt during my life, you know, that didn't fit into mm -hmm. the words, the categories I was given before. There's lots of things that I felt that I've never even talked to anyone else about. So I'm really excited to hear about all these new things because it's like, ah, I'm not, this is, this is a, a way for me to find my place, you know, as well, you know? Yeah. And ultimately that's, that's 
kind of what Pride and the LGBTQIA spectrum have always been about, finding yourself right. and being true to yourself. And uh, yeah, having discussions and being able to talk about such things in a you know, safe and welcoming manner is how people figure things out for themselves. Right, right, right. Yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. <laughs> cool. So, so my, 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 my first question is that, um, and this is a super basic one, is that kind of the understanding that I'd come to have of uh, sex and, and gender uh, and these issues is kind of your basic um, second wave um, uh, interpretation, which is that sex refers to biology and gender refers to social constructs. So this was how it was always talked about and how I came to understand it. So sex is just kind of something you're born with. Gender is then put on top of it and gender obvious and these constructs obviously differ, you know, tremendously all around the world from culture to culture, what's considered masculine, what's considered feminine, et cetera, et cetera, you know? So, um, precisely. Right. Right. And so, so, my, my first question, which I think a lot of questions, I think this would be the first question for a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I'm Gen X. So for a lot of people, you know, my age or older would be like, okay, so these new ideas and words that we're hearing about, uh, does it replace this old understanding? Does it add on to it? Or how does it, how, like starting from there, how much do I need to throw away or, or, or mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Well, it's, uh, yeah, the, the way that I have a tendency to think about it is that it's not that you necessarily have to uh, throw anything away. It's just like more description, more details upon the subject. And uh, it's, it's kind of funny because uh, when I was much, much younger, uh, I used to be uh, critiqued for having a black and white uh, view of the world. Like things were morally... Um, correct or morally incorrect. Uh, and I didn't have a whole heck of a lot of uh, um, gray area in between that. And right. that's very much how we uh, are taught in this day and age uh, to think about things like gender or sex. But you're, you're, you're right. The, uh, the general understanding is uh, essentially that sex is the set of biological and physiological characteristics that determine someone's uh, makeup and how their body is going to grow. And gender is essentially the social construct that's based off of uh, emotional, uh, behavioral, and cultural, as you said, characteristics attached to a person's sex. But it's just attached. You know, it's kind of ambiguous. It's just like, oh, you have these genitals. Therefore, you're going to be a sports fan or you're going to like princesses. Mm -hmm. It's like the entire thing has been distilled down to two little things that uh, it really it really seems to uh, show a great deal of United States culture in that right. regard. Like everything has to be summed down to two little convenient packages. When in reality, biologically speaking, scientifically speaking, no, there's a lot of gray area going on out there. And just because you got X, Y, or Z when you were born doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to continue to be the case. And I think, uh, I think that's really part of the modern trans struggle uh, these days is that so many people are misinformed and don't want to learn new categories or descriptions or words uh, when they think what they have learned is just fine so far. It's, it's like uh, the educational system is set up for something very, very streamlined that will benefit society in some sort of financial, but not necessarily social construct. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, this, this uh, idea of the duality in our culture and how it presents us with a lot of false choices is a, um, a theme that's been coming up over and over again in this podcast <laughs> on mm -hmm. a number of, of different topics. Yeah, I do not doubt it. Yeah, yeah, One of my uh, earliest ways of putting it uh, was going to a restaurant and you have the option of Coke or Pepsi. Maybe I wanted coffee. Right. <laughs> Can I just have coffee? And it's like, no. You have to pick right. one of the two sponsors and right. life is more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And I feel as though um, there's a direct analog from, from that to 
returning to the early 80s there. I mean, late 80s, early 90s there when I was involved in these in these things in that way. And, you know, there was definitely people who didn't want to hear about this stuff. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. you know, I... I was out of college doing this. And so it was a little easier to do it there than, you know, quite out in the real world, you know, or something like that. But there was still um, resistance. And from, mm -hmm. well, there's just always the people who don't want to, um, don't want to hear about new ideas, I guess. They're just, they just, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe part of that's just because we live in such a stressful culture already. Mm -hmm. I mean, what with capitalism and all that. And so I think that there's maybe people who, who, because life is already so stressful, uh, don't want to have to think about, you know, anything. And so I guess I can have some compassion, you know, in one way from that, you know, mm -hmm. um, but there's also been a lot of, you know, hate that's been coming out and a lot of like real meanness that's been coming up around all these issues too, that to me seems completely unnecessary. No, it isn't. As with most things, uh, a great deal of my compassion um, with regards to individuals who just cannot, you know, figure it out, can't understand why they need to learn a new way of being respectful. Uh, and it basically comes down to uh, the mentality uh, that is oftentimes seen uh, more so on the right hand side of the political spectrum, this idea of a, uh, a mythical, uh, traditional uh, way of family life and right. of being. And and it's like uh, the social contract uh, that we all seem to sign with society is that there are certain things that are always going to be the way. Like you have a mom, you have a dad, you have the 2.5 kids in a white picket fence. And th this is the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And our culture was sold on this idea sometime in the 50s and probably even sooner than that when you talk about any colonialist uh, <laughs> endeavor. Right. But, uh, but basically, we got sold on that uh, 1950s, uh, you know, wholesome, all-American, leave-it-to-beaver family. And people started saying, no, that doesn't apply. That doesn't apply to me. That isn't me. Right. And right. then the traditionalists are like, but it has to, because that's the way it is. And so it's like right. the cognitive dissonance makes it very, very difficult for people to learn new aspects of the society around them. Because... That's how cognitive dissonance works. Right, you know, right, new right. information is incoming and part of your brain just wants to shut that down because it doesn't match your worldview. Right, right. I mean, and and what's being what's being what's being stretched here or expanded or or you know liberated or whatever in, in some sense, I guess, is is the word is is the sense of what it means to be uh, a man or a woman or dot dot dot, right? Yeah. So I think. This is part of, this is part of, um, you know, one of the arguments that's going on or something like mm -hmm. that. I don't want to say there's two sides because I, I feel like it's more complicated, you know, you know, than you that. Know you know what I mean? You know, I, absolutely. I mean, there's people who sort of try to present it that way in monolithic terms, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I, at the same time, it's like, okay, what, what's the, um, what's the response to, okay, you know, well, you know, you were born in a hospital and they put this, that this, they, they checked this box for sex on your birth certificate. And now you want to call yourself, you know, the other box. And well, mm -hmm. that's bullshit. Some people will say, you know? Yeah, of course they do. Right. But when you're only given two options, that's how it is. It's just like when, when we're, when we're gendering uh, infants, essentially, uh, when we are putting a life path in front of our children when they are born right it's convenient is really what it comes down to it's convenient to just base people on uh, their genitals is really what it comes down to which right. is kind of funny that it is uh considered to be so normal um because it's like you don't know what a person is going to be and how they're going to live their life and what experiences they're going to encounter Right. at such a young age so why put them into a box except for the convenience of those who choose what the boxes are yeah you know right. it's not convenient for the individual it's convenient for everyone else right right so we, we hear the phrase trans women are women for example and that's mm -hmm. the one that really seems to get under the skin of people in mm -hmm. particular and so i'm hoping you could talk about that 
phrase? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, it's very complicated, and I certainly have my own perspectives on the matter. But uh, the thing is, is that uh, let's start with the base terms. Uh, so okay. we've got uh, trans mm -hmm. and uh, the other cis. So basically, this is just Latin. This is just how we describe such things. Uh, trans is on the other side of, and mm -hmm. cis simply means on this side of. <clears throat> So that, you know, those two are kind of a uh, duality, a binary in and of themselves, um, mostly because just like, oh, I'm near. Nope, actually, I'm far. And so separating right. that does get under people's skin, mostly because they're unfamiliar with A, Latin, or B, why they should have to add a descriptor to something that C is supposed to be a binary of two options and two options only. Right. So th there is a inherent irony in the language uh, and how it is used when describing trans issues, um, especially when it comes to like who gets to define the defining characteristics of what is woman. Right. You know, right. Right. And uh, it's 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 interesting, mostly because when I first uh, started reading up on feminism in, I want to say, the mid 90s, um, I was in high school at the time and uh, my mother worked for Cascades AIDS Project. So like being nice to gay and lesbian people was just something I was raised with. Mm -hmm. She's like, duh, they have a hard enough time right now. Be nice. Right. <laughs> You know, so I lucked out pretty well uh, as far as being raised that way. Uh, but at the same time, it's like the language usage within uh, feminism has changed so much in the past two decades. And uh, like everybody has been taught various iterations of feminism, you know, and uh, the most modern, of course, is uh, intersectional, which means, no, we're talking about everybody here. We're not right. just talking about, you know, we're not just talking about uh, soccer moms who are right. lesbians, you know, right. we're not talking about like, you know, white middle class gay folk here. We're talking about the people who are like getting kicked off to the side, not being paid attention to respected or, or, or having an easy time of life. <laughs> right. And so there's a lot of conflict in, in and of that, but uh, the most recent uh, and more loud, I guess you could say, more vocal aspects of uh, feminism right now is the difference between those who consider themselves to be intersectional feminists and those who consider themselves to be traditional uh, feminists. Hmm, okay. And uh, one way of looking at that is that initially, uh, feminism said very interestingly that a woman or a man but more specifically women, a woman should not be defined by her genitals. And right. everybody was pretty much on board with that initially. It's just like, yes, just because you don't have the penis in the room doesn't mean that you shouldn't also have as much respect, human rights and autonomy over your own living conditions. And uh, then as over the years, um, trans started becoming more of a topic that could be publicly discussed. And then you saw this splintering inside of the feminist movements where some people calling themselves feminists were not including uh, trans women under that umbrella. Right. Um, specifically because of reasons like, you know, not being able to understand um, the monthly cycle for instance, or not being able to have children. And that became the defining characteristics. Just like, no, no. I mean, might be nice to you, but you're not a real woman, you know? Right. And so it becomes this, uh, this, this gatekeeping system of like, oh no, we're inclusive except for you because you don't match the criteria that we just set down. Now, the irony is, is that that is judging somebody based off of their genitals. Right. which is one of the first things that feminism is telling you not to fucking do. <laughs> right. And so that's, that's what has given rise to this more uh, conservative uh, 
form of feminism. And uh, it has definitely splintered people apart. Uh, there's been tons of times where I have been like invited by cisgendered women to like a female only event. Right. And I'll just be all like, I appreciate that you chose to invite me. However, uh, that particular organization or that event uh, does not particularly care for women like me. Right. And uh, then it's just kind of that dawning moment on them where they're all like, oh, I was inviting you along in the spirit of sisterhood. And I invited you to a place where you would not be tolerated, welcome, or treated with respect. And I'm sorry. Also, I'm not going to go to that event now. <laughs> right. But it usually happens like one conversation at a time because not everybody, you know, looks at YouTube videos for their research or, you know, dives in or has the time to dive in, you know, when everybody's working to make sure that they are able to put food on the table and have a roof over their head, they're not necessarily going to have time for the research necessary to make society better. Right, right. Yeah, because one of the things that I've, I've you know, that I've heard often is, you know, well, there was a lot of work that was done to be able to create women-only spaces, and mm -hmm. now the spaces are being invaded. That's why. Infiltrated. Right, that's, yeah. that's what that side says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the problem with that argument and a lot of the people that wind up making it is that I can't really give you statistics on this one, but a common thing that I have seen is that uh, some women-only spaces will say no trans women, but they are okay with trans men, but then they're constantly misgendering them. Uh, right. And so it becomes this kind of, well, okay, this is just uterus worship at this point, vagina mm -hmm. worship. What is this? Right. Because saying one thing and then doing another very much looks like the thing that they were supposed to be decrying. And I have to admit, you know, I've grown up in Portland and the Pacific Northwest and uh, things are a little bit more progressive in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes I don't have to deal with that. Right. And I feel very fortunate. And it's one of the reasons I enjoy being in Portland because people are usually kind of understanding when they want to genuinely know something. Right, right. You but just use the term, the time, I'll go, I'll go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, it's just like elsewhere in the country, that's gonna be dealt with an awful lot of the time and it's not fair. <laughs> Yeah, no, things will be dealt with differently. I, I was born and raised in, in Nebraska and things are different there than, <laughs> than, oh, yeah. than, than, than in Portland. And I, I must prefer it in Portland personally. Yeah, definitely. You used the word uh, misgendering right now. I just wanted to underline that and put that mm -hmm. out there and just talk about that for a minute. Because that's also, uh, I, well, some people, that would be a very new term. Mm. So misgendering is basically uh, the, the assumption uh, that a person can make about which pronouns to use with regards to talking about somebody else. So basically, if somebody comes out as trans and changes their pronouns, you know, the respectful thing to do is just address them by those pronouns, you know? And I first heard about this, I want to say 1996, honestly. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so it's just like, I was just starting high school, but but I knew this very basic thing. It was just kind of like, look, this person appears to be dressed in a feminine manner. However, everything in society tells me that I'm supposed to use certain pronouns with them and they are not she, her. Right. But I was just like, I see how you are dressed. I see how you are presenting. I will call you what you want. Right. That just seems respectful. Right. <laughs> but, uh, misgendering is uh, either by purpose or by uh, accident, you know, totally happens, um, calling somebody by the opposite gender right. that they self-identify as. Right, right. And this is different. This is also a different understanding of pronouns and gender, I think, than say, I remember in the early 90s when I was hanging out in gay bars a lot in Minneapolis, and uh, when I first got out of Omaha, that's where I went, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, uh, it was, it was pretty common, you know, 
uh, uh, for, 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 for gay guys at that time to refer to each other as sister or to use mm-hmm. she or miss mm-hmm. thing, you know what I mean? All this kind of Queen. thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I, I'm familiar with that and already was, was in that milieu for a while, you know, and, and really had a lot of fun with that, you know, personally, you know what I mean? But now I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, but, but this is, this is different than, than that now. Yeah, yeah. What you're talking about, and I, I get to uh, my current workplace allows for a lot of that. Uh, uh-huh. We just we just recently had a uh, a drive through drag show uh, during uh, <laughs> during the winter months, just uh-huh. uh, just to keep business going. Um, but at nice. the same time, uh, a lot of the people that I work with um, are gay, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, there's a lot of that uh, uh, slang. Uh, thrown around you know like oh queen oh girl oh yeah mm." and it's just like it's 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 very accentuating and I know it's not meant in the same spirit as like you know gendering somebody right you know it's just part of gay culture where we have had a lot of play with gender which is why it's so amusing to me that we're still talking about this like 40 years on like what was Stonewall almost 50 years ago uh, slightly more than 50 because that, exactly. that was 69 yeah yeah mm-hmm. there you go yeah but yeah and it's just kind of like this has been part of the culture why is it that people inside of the community still have trouble with this right. and uh it's just a, it's just a matter of the learning curves you know everybody has them right well there has been some kind of ramp up in the last decade or mm-hmm. or, or so and there's been i don't know if this is because there's more new ideas or if it's just that ideas that were knocking on for a while reached a critical mass because of the mm-hmm. internet or because of social media or what, but it's definitely a different discussion that we're having mm-hmm. now than we were having even in 2010, for example. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, it's funny that you mentioned 2010 because uh, I recall reading uh, articles around that period of time mm-hmm. towards the tail end of the, uh, the midpoint to the tail end of the Obama administration. Right. Uh, and in which like, you know, trans women were starting to get acting roles and mm-hmm. becoming popular and right. famous in certain ways. And, you know, there was a lot more exposure and, and, and attention being paid to, yeah, these people are fine. <laughs> right. You know, it, it's like trans folk were starting to get normalized. And I think that's part of the social uh, ramp up as far as the uh, conversation is concerned, because, you know, in intersectional feminism, this is perfectly reasonable. It's just like, yes, recognize people for their differences doesn't mean you have to treat them any differently. It just means they're here and that's okay. Right. Uh, there was also a point in time and uh, one of my favorites, because uh, it was a, it was a funny unexpected hot mic kind of moment uh, mm-hmm. in which then uh, Vice President Biden uh, like leaned over to Obama and he's just like, you know, we should probably pla- pass some legislation on, uh, on uh, trans folk uh, having equal rights because, you know, that's kind of going to be like one of the next uh, civil rights things. And uh, Obama was just kind of like, uh, yeah, yeah, shut up. Uh, <laughs> he's oh, like, heard that. shush. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about that right now. <laughs> right. And it's unclear what uh, the intention was behind that shush, um, because it's like, on one hand, as we've seen this past year, we still haven't figured out uh, the civil rights of black folk. So it's just right. like, we don't, we don't need mm-hmm. to be like putting people into like these pedestals of like, okay, now you get rights. Right. Waited a few decades, but now you get rights. Right. And uh, so people really started latching onto that and talking about it. And uh, we got to see a lot of it during the Trump administration as well, uh, coming from uh, conservative feminist circles. Like they had pretty much just nailed that out right there. Uh, that just like, no, my definition of feminism means discluding these people. Right. You know, right. Mm-hmm. and that's why it's so interesting uh, to see in a, in a way, like feminism itself has gotten co-opted by the right and they can't seem to understand on the right wing of the social landscape that that feminism not only like only 30 years ago is when we started really seeing that ramp up of right wing uh talk radio um just like demonizing uh the lgbt folks but also feminism itself 
And so it's interesting that, you know, a couple decades later, we started seeing this, 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 this kind of anti-feminism that's still masqueraded as feminism itself, you know? Right, right, right. I mean, it's part of this too, I think, I mean, there's, there's definitely, since you brought in politics, there's definitely been different uh, legal stuff that's been happening, that's been being tossed around, uh, new ideas mm -hmm. being brought in. And then like, for example, um, uh, what was it with Trump and trans people in the military? He like, yeah, he did an entire ban. No trans people in the military at all. Right. Um, right. Which, you know, of course. On yeah. one hand, of course. Right. He's like, I am a big friend to all of the LGBT folk, except this one. Right, right. <laughs> and so it's just like, I think that singling out uh, really brought it up on a lot of people's uh, political radar, so to speak. Right. And uh, it being uh, done and performed by such a bombastic uh, is the most diplomatic way I could put him. <laughs> right. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, but having such a bombastic individual like that, uh, really drawing attention to it, um, accidentally hurting his own cause, because I doubt very seriously he meant to activate anybody. Uh, right. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, a lot of people on the left started being a little bit more critical um, of those who claim to be radical feminists, but still behaved in such a right-wing manner. Right, right. And then the one thing that I just personally would throw in about the military is that, you know, when the, the gays in the military first thing first came up in the 90s, you know, for example, mm -hmm. you know, as a lifelong pacifist, I'm like, I want to abolish the military and I want to abolish the draft and draft registration and all of that. Uh, that's that's more important to me than inclusivity in some way you know i mean yeah okay if it has to be there then i guess then well then sure it needs to be inclusive but i personally i'd rather have the conversation about getting rid of the military and, and the effort there you know and i'd rather you know get rid of marriage honestly mm -hmm. as well than make it more equal and so i suppose there's that I mean, and i recognize that that there, there's there's a split um, you know, in, in the gay community on these issues, you know what I mean? Uh, oh, on yeah. those things. And I'm sure that there is in, in, in trans communities about these issues too. Oh, goodness. Yes. Um, one of my favorite ones, since you mentioned, uh, gays in the military, I, uh, I recall, uh, I was working in a grocery store at the time, but, uh, when gay folk were finally allowed to join the military, right. um, I had like a lot of friends, a lot of my gay friends were just like, oh my goodness, isn't this an exciting day? Mm -hmm. Gays can be in the military. I just immediately countered with, yeah, are you signing up? And they're like, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, see? So it's just like, it's largely a symbolic thing. Right. But right. it also brings up, like I've, I've been talking about intersectional uh, feminism as being like the more progressive left wing way of um, just including everybody and not dis including people. Um, but there's also this, uh, this, this creep that kind of pops up uh, when it comes to subjects like, you know, oh, you're equal. Now you can get gay married and now you can join gay military or, you know, just like, and I have a right. tendency to think of these things as uh, the antithesis of intersectional feminism. And I tend to call it uh, intersectional fa fascism. Right. Right. But, yeah. I mean, people were telling me that I should be so proud when uh, here in Portland a few years back, we had um, our first uh, trans uh, police lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of my you know, friends and family were just kind of like, hey, this is great. Aren't you excited about this wonderful thing? And I'm like, I can't be excited about right. somebody joining the police who routinely oppress minority figures. I mean, I don't care what their gender is. I don't care that they're trans. I don't care about any of that. It's a police officer and they represent right. police officers, yeah. not the people, not yeah. minority groups, not anything other than right. protecting property and occasionally murdering people. So yeah. it's just like, no, I'm not happy that a trans person is in the police force. I think that's horrible. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, no, I, I would like to see the the police as they currently exist abolished, you know? 
I'm right there personally. with you. Yeah, I don't yeah. think it's necessary. <laughs> yeah, there's I don't a lot think of it's other necessary. ways. It's an, yeah. it's an ancient relic of of it's it's a shell of its even former self, which wasn't right. good to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've looked all into the roots of it. There was never really a good moment uh, to go no. back to with that with that one either. But no. it's like what we were talking about beforehand. It's that social contract, that leave right. it to beaver kind of attitude. Right. And we just pull all of that stuff with us. You know, it's just like 2.5 kids in a white picket fence, but also officer friendly. Yeah. You know, and it's yeah. just like that. That's not real. These are humans. They're just as flawed as the rest of us, sometimes even more so because they have right. power. Yeah. Yeah. No, for real. For real. Now, you haven't used the term. Um, but I wanted to bring it up because, because we hear it, there's a term, mm -hmm. uh, turf that comes up, which stands yes. for trans exclusionary radical feminist. And mm -hmm. I just, I, I just had to say that the first time I heard this term and I, I interpreted it perhaps incorrectly, uh, I interpreted mm -hmm. it as kind of a, a slam on radical feminists. And to me, mm -hmm. my mind went right back to the nineties and Rush Limbaugh and mm -hmm. just what an asshole he was with his mm -hmm. feminazi stuff and how he was always, you know, railing against feminists. And so, so I was uncomfortable with that term the first time I've heard it and I haven't used it personally, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in writing or in, or in speech because I just haven't been, been comfortable with it. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to hear what you thought about that, about that term. I've had a uh, interesting relationship with the term. It's not one that I, use too terribly often but at the same time you know talking about the privilege of being in portland and uh i just haven't had to use it either you know right it's okay. just like i've never mm -hmm. encountered any individuals uh in my daily life to which such a term um would actually i don't know be appropriate it's one of those things it's like i self-select which words that i choose to use in public and that's a responsibility, part of my social contract. Uh, right, right. But uh, the funny thing about turf, though, is that um, it was originally attributed to uh, a, a blogger in 2008 um, who was uh, later interviewed after it had like gained some steam in feminist uh, talking circles. And uh, the way that they designed uh, the acronym for turf uh, was originally... Uh, supposed to be a technically neutral uh, description of ah. a particular activist grouping. Right. So it wasn't intended to be used in a positive or negative way. It was just uh -huh. supposed to be like, these are self-professed radical feminists who are trans exclusionary. Right. That's it. Right. Um, but it's, 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 it's kind of funny uh, that they admit it has turned into kind of a weaponized uh, uh, descriptor right. uh, in certain circles. And uh, I also don't agree with that. You know, right. it's like that's unnecessary and unhelpful. However, how are you going to describe somebody right. who is claiming something about themselves, but defining themselves by their exclusion of other people? It seems fairly neutral and I'm pretty okay with it. Right. Um, there is another acronym um, that has been pushed uh, or suggested, I guess, by the internet as a whole, that mm -hmm. instead of TERF, specific people who it applies to should use uh, the, the acronym is, is it? Ah, Feminist Appropriating Reactionary Transphobes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, which is the acronym FARTS. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, I found that rather amusing. And yeah. I find that there are a lot, a lot less people that I am willing to call farts than I am right. turfs. Right. You know? Right. Just like, but at the same time, uh, the term turf is used in the description of modern day feminism. It is a term. And right. so if you're looking at this from a educational standpoint with regards to feminism, it's a neutral term. Right. It's how people use neutral terms that matters. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way before, but you're right, of course, that there is a category of people who can be accurately described that way. Mm -hmm. Well, and back to genders, uh, that's why they, them is a uh -huh. nice catch-all when you don't actually know and can't assume somebody's gender. 
Right. And that's one of my favorite ones because we use it all of the time. We do. Mm -hmm. We use Mm -hmm. it all of the time in language. And so it's just kind of like, oh, somebody lost their keys. Yeah. I guess we'll hold on to them until they right <laughs> get them it's like we do it all of the time so that's why yeah. it's equally amusing when people are like oh they them is so un-english and i'm like man shakespeare did it yeah yeah no i mean the the, the kind of case where you're talking about there of like somebody lost their keys mm-hmm. I, that's literally been in use my entire life like mm-hmm. i've always heard people talk like that i've always talked like that somebody lost his keys sounds yeah. a little strange because how do you know yeah someone and, yeah, someone lost his or her keys is like mm-hmm. kind of long. I mean, you know, like, yeah, it's like yeah. why are we cramming in two genders when yeah. we don't know? Yeah, yeah, no. So that that one's always amused me too. That the whole idea that they them is is yeah. Okay. Well, and also I'm a writing major. I would just like to say that was my degree in, in school. You know, and I and I've and and you know, I started writing when I was like you know literally ten years old is when I wrote my first um, uh, uh, short story you know, which mm-hmm. was a science fiction piece, actually, and I, I could share it with you sometime. But, but um, uh, my whole writing life, I've, um, uh, you know, just noticed how it, we don't have a gender non-specific pronoun mm-hmm. to use, you know, and mm-hmm. how awkward that is, you know, because you can say, you know, well, you know, one can walk down the sidewalk and one can look at the clock tower or you can say one, you know what I mean? But that's just sort mm-hmm. of kind of formal sounding and no one, it, work, it works in writing sometimes, but it doesn't work in speech, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, well, they, them, and there, that's just what we have. And that is the usage that's already there. And so I, I don't, yeah. I mean, English just isn't good at that part, you know? No, yeah. no. We, <laughs> in, well, United States English, and I guess right. English, English have completely borrowed from other cultures so many times that right. it's a wonder it functions at all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's certainly true. Um, yeah. But we still manage to figure out ways to communicate with each other. You know, yeah. that's that's a big part of uh, being trans in the modern age is knowing what words you're using. Right, right, right. What what uh, whether um, what. Uh, what other words, you know, do you see that come up that that um, that that are uh, controversial or misunderstood or that need explaining? Um. Well, actually, um, I've got one for you, mm-hmm. uh, and that is. So during the nineties, um, mm-hmm. I I would hear you know snippets about trans people, uh, and back then it was uh, it was uh, called uh, being transsexual. Right, right. Um, in, now we say transgender because it's a lot more accurate. Mm-hmm. And it also had a completely different connotation mm-hmm. uh, back in the 90s. It was just like, oh, this person is this gender, but they want to be that one. As opposed to the modern context where it's just like, now we understand with transgender, first off and foremost, it's not about what's in your pants. It's about what you self-identify in your own mind and right. that is the gender as the social construct as opposed to something that is defined by uh biological or genetic considerations right and uh honestly when it comes to genetic considerations it's just like there's a good percentage of the world that is not obviously male or female if you were to only look at their genetics Okay. So it's just like, even that's not accurate as a right. definition of a binary construct. Like right. our species just isn't set up to be Coke versus Pepsi. Uh, right, 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 right. We evolved out of that. Right. Yeah. And, and I think I also had maybe heard the word transsexual um, back in the 90s to specifically mean people who were um, going to be going through surgery and, mm-hmm. other, and, and other medical procedures and that being the idea that was going on there too Mm -hmm. yeah and it's kind of fascinating because um like just just based off of my own observations like i remember that being a thing in the 90s but then uh in the early 2000s it like somewhere in there like somewhere between 1999 to 2005 it was just like nope transgender now right i also noticed that over in the uk it took another 10 years before they mm-hmm. eventually stopped um, using transsexual. 
right. uh, as a descriptor. And so it's just like being around the internet in the early aughts, it was just kind of like, oh, they're using this word. Where is this article from? You know, so I could easily right. discern where uh, US or UK somebody was coming from on this subject, uh, right. just based off of the language usage. But also there's some trickle off, you know, because some people will continuously use uh, things that they should have stopped using 10 years ago, but they just right, didn't right. learn any different. And uh, yeah, it really just comes down to who's speaking and uh, what language they're using and how accurate it can be perceived by, you know, that's the other thing is that people have access to things on the internet that doesn't necessarily mean they have the wisdom and the information to make better decisions on how to research the subjects. So it's not inherently anybody's fault that some people do not understand you know it's just a byproduct of living in a society right right so so is there some degree to which we can say that um sex is simply not considered to be very important anymore the gender is considered to be the primary thing i wouldn't necessarily put them into a uh, higher priority and lower priority uh -huh. um because you know the whole idea is that the individual is expressing themselves. Right. And as foreign of a concept as it is for me, sometimes I, I can acknowledge and, 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 and look at straight folk, for instance, and be like, yes, that is one way of living your life. And right. you, you felt that this was appropriate for you. And so go, go do, go do your, go do your straight thing. That's cool. Right. That's right. not for me, but you know, I'm, I'm okay with it. No, I'm not threatened by it. <laughs> right, right. But when we talk about, um, well, okay, I guess, because you had said uh, we're talking about, when we're talking about, we're talking about how one, all this not being about um, biology, but about how we feel about ourselves in our head. Right? Mm -hmm. so in a way, that's to say, yeah, what we're talking about here is gender, but not sex. Yes. And so basically that, it, it, if I'm interpreting the question correctly, um, the importance, um, I don't know, is necessarily there. I think the focus uh, okay. is, is really what it's more about, um, because that's the problem with a lot of the um, traditionalist mindset is that, you know, this right here is inherently better. Uh, than that. That is some sort of other thing, you know? And uh, so I try to stay away from that uh, with regards to whether or not sex or gender is more of the priority in how we use language, because they refer to very specific things. And there's even, um, there's even folks out there that say it's the same thing, and that there shouldn't actually be a division at all. But right. they have different definitions for how it's the same you know <laughs> okay so it's just one of those uh like what is it uh so here here's an example um because uh some people will do the difference of like nope here is gender gender is this sex is this right. but we still use gendered terms for that it's right. just like so you're a trans woman but you have male genitalia right you know and so that separates the discussion uh, into basically its older form, which is defining people based off of their genitals and nothing else. Whereas if you consider uh, gender and sex to be a same thing, then you should have no problem being able to just go, no, this is a woman's penis. Right. And that's just how it is. Right. You know, but it's a lot of people have a difficult time getting their head wrapped around that uh, because we're taught that one is one. And it's just like sometimes, not always. Right, right. So so then being trans in, in a way has nothing to do with uh, anatomy. It doesn't necessarily. No, it really doesn't. Right. Like, I know gender neutral individuals who, you know, absolutely are just like, nope, I am this way. This is how it is. Please deal with it. <laughs> Please right. be nice. Right. You know, and at that point in time, it's just like, okay, well, whatever your sex is, that's yours. It's your business. And honestly, that's how it should be 
all of the time anyway. Right. Right. Okay. So then, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there was, there was, um, and I think that a lot of this is, um, is easy for people once they think about it, once they hear about it, once they hear it spelled out, you know, and, you know, uh, and then, then what changes for some people is when there's different, um, you know, legal implications, you know, like mm. we were talking about before, you know, like with the, with the, with the, you know, military marriage, that kind of thing, you know? And, um, mm -hmm. so, so like a controversial topic that's been getting a lot of attention in the last year has been, um, sports, like especially young people's sports, yeah. right. And that's the one place where I kind of pause and I'm like, okay, so mm -hmm. there's hormonal differences that were happening with these individuals, you know, mm -hmm. you know, up to a certain place that, that, that bodies were forming in different ways. And, and so like, I hear this one, I'm like, okay, this is where I have some pause myself or where I'm like, well, I'm not sure about this one, you know, mm -hmm. about, about, about people who were, people who were born you know, and got the X in them and the mail on their birth certificate, then going into sports, you know, mm -hmm. that, that are, that are, um, you know, been reserved for people who've got the X on the, on the female on their birth certificate. So I was hoping you could exactly. talk about this. Cause this one, this, this is the one where I'm just kind of like confused or confounded or whatever, you know? Sure. And at face value, it does seem like a little confusing, I guess you could say on face value. Um, it was about, uh, <clears throat> let's see, I'd like to say it was about five, maybe six years ago that that really started popping up as a subject. Mm -hmm. um, a particular uh, podcaster whose name I will, will not mention uh, definitely uh, picked up on, uh, there was a mixed martial arts uh, fighter who transitioned. And so the entire argument was basically like, uh, well, they shouldn't be able to compete against other women uh, as a trans woman because they have different muscle mass and bone density right. and whatnot. Uh, and so a lot of people, you know, looked at that and blanched. And I even had a few friends in uh, like few really close friends who were just kind of like, yeah, that does seem a little like, you know, somebody who has been uh, developing differently might have some sort of advantage right and uh the funny thing is is that when because because most of the public is so incredibly uh misguided on what it like what kind of medical transition a trans person takes and how it actually affects their body okay um mm -hmm. but the thing is is that there are sports standards already in place in many many places that deal with this very, very specifically. Like, okay. okay, if you're an athlete who has transitioned, then before you can compete in that particular version of the gendered sport, we need to take a look at your uh, at your levels. And uh, you should have been uh, medically transitioning at the very least with hormones for X amount of time. And it's oh, okay. usually like a year and a half. So it's just like the sports person takes a year off and uh, gets themselves all fixed up and then they have to be double checked. But, uh, but the funny thing is, is that uh, you can also have the exact opposite uh, of unintended consequences with uh, some of those rulings. Like it was just recent, uh, I can't remember their name, but uh, it was this woman who was kicked off of a tennis competition in Europe because she had too much testosterone in her body. Uh -huh. right. And she was a cisgendered woman. Like, right. and so it's just like, okay, when you start making a bunch of regulations, Interesting. other people get caught in the crosshairs that have nothing to do with the subject, which is kind of fascinating to me. Um, and it's, it's just in how we approach other people. You know, you'll have, like say, a, a butch lesbian, for instance, just using the bathroom, but somebody else in there's like, nope, you're obviously a male, you know? Right. And it's just like, everybody gets caught in the crosshairs when you try to set uh, certain definitions of appropriateness for trans bodies. And, uh, but I'll get back to the sports thing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, it, it was very confusing for a while. I even had to, you know, hit the books and just like, okay, bone density changes when you take certain uh, hormones, your muscle density changes. And, uh, 
it's it's not a completely accurate standpoint, but it does deserve uh, examining um, with with a with a relatively critical eye, you know, because I mean, you can't just look at the face value of uh, the trans people in sports argument. Like there's a lot of depth that needs to go into that particular subject. Right. And I appreciate you bringing it up mostly because it is one. It's completely a question. Right. 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 And then you mentioned um, testing for hormone levels in people's bodies, because this is happening in professional sports uh, as a matter of course, for them, for testing for, um, well, to see if people are juicing, right? I mean, if they're yeah, using, exactly. um, right, right, right. If they're using, um, uh, what's the word? I'm not thinking of it right now. Steroids. Steroids. Thank you. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And they usually call them doping scandals. I mean, like Russia got kicked right. out of the Olympics one year. Right. Um, because they just had way too many of their athletes popping up with doping. And it's just right. like, yeah, remember, no steroids. It's the Olympics. Right. But at the same right. time, that's why in professional sports, there are medical um, standards um, specifically dealing with like, OK, are you playing fairly or not? Like, right. are you using the epitome of the human condition or are you are you are you warping it so that you are stronger or faster or that? But right. uh, it's it's kind of a reversal when it comes to this, mostly because when it first started popping up, it wasn't using steroids it's just the social assumption that those who have been raised socially as male um, and with those corresponding associated uh, hormonal levels that they are going to be inherently bigger stronger and faster but this just kicks back to the old traditionalist perspective on well, men have these bodies, women have these bodies, and they should always be defined by these characteristics. You know, the idea that women are somehow automatically submissive or quiet or docile or meek, comparatively speaking to primary male breadwinner. You know, right. it's just like, this is a lot of assumptions that are just like underneath um, and right in your face of uh, the way that we interact and think about such subjects. So it's kind of interesting seeing the reversal of that right where it's just kind of like, well, that doesn't appear to be acceptable, but at the same time, we live in a patriarchal society. And so that's just how it is. So right. it gets very confusing when we start talking about like the very, very specific minutia of whether or not trans people are allowed to play sports. Right, <laughs> And right. if so, with who? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And yeah, I'm like, and this sounds like a, this sounds like a schoolyard playground kind of argument, you know? Right. But it's only after everybody has access to the same amount of information that it becomes obvious in hindsight that this is kind of a non-issue. Right. Like it's not widespread enough of an issue to warrant this kind of international discussion. Right, right. So, so this could even, maybe this is one of those cases where um, something, some very niche thing is brought mm -hmm. up and, and used uh, to to cast a, a paw over a much wider, you know what I mean, to catch a, a wider net than it really really exactly. can be cast, you know, in order to, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I was yeah. also um, I was also unaware that that um, uh, professional sports already had some of this stuff in place um, already that can just be used this way, mm -hmm. you know, as well. That that's very interesting to me. Yeah. And well, I mean, you'll see you'll see various things like that in uh, in other subject matters as well, uh -huh. where it's just like somebody takes like a very small piece of an argument and then uses that to explain everything else right. while not showing the full breadth of information available on the subject. And so that's why people have a tendency to uh, hold on to uh, those sensationalist uh, articles that they find on the internet. Right. Because it's like, oh, this is brought to me very, very simply, very, very straightforward. Right. And it helps out my worldview that I already have. So I don't have to change a thing. Right. Right. Yeah. This but is a like, particular logical fallacy on those list of logical fallacies, isn't it? Oh, yes. It is definitely <laughs> on there. But logical fallacies, whether or not we like them, uh, spread and right. uh, they become their own kind of propaganda, depending upon who's saying it and for what reason. I mean, you bring up Rush Limbaugh, for instance. Right. And it's just kind of like, nope, I saw what he was selling back in the 90s. And yeah. I said, no, that guy's mean. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You but know, it, it still travels. It still goes, and oh, certain people definitely. latch onto it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned uh, acting really briefly just a little while mm -hmm. ago. I just wanted to bring that one in, uh, you know, too, um, because. Uh, I, I have to say that that you know, just a, 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 as as a queer man and as an a, 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 a queer man who's known you know a lot of people in the acting community and hung out with theater crowds before and stuff like that. I mean, mm -hmm. sort of my, the first thing I think of when we start to talk about you know different people playing different things is that's like, well, lots of straight characters have been played by gay people over time. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is also true. This is absolutely also true. So, so many. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I just have to kind of get that laugh out of the way, you know. <laughs> no, it is First, one of my know? favorites. Uh, like, for instance, when uh, <laughs> Sir Ian McKellen came out, right, right. You know, he finally came out, and everybody's just uh -huh. like, "Wow, how did you, how did you pretend to be straight all this time?" He's like, "I'm an actor." <laughs> <laughs> right. You right. Know? Right. You know, then at the same time, I can look in an old movie like, oh, is it, um, is it like Breakfast at Tiffany's? I can't remember which one where like Mickey Rooney oh, yeah. plays uh, an Asian man and they put like fake teeth on him and, or mm -hmm. maybe it's not oh. Breakfast at Tiffany's, but it's from maybe that it same was. era. It's from that same era. And it's just like, okay. Um, so yeah, obviously some people shouldn't be acting as other people. I mean, okay. There's a line no. somewhere. <laughs> do not do not do the caricature thing uh, right <laughs> that right is inappropriate that is a bad stereotype yeah yeah or even, even yeah, the fact I mean, that like mm -hmm. i was gonna about oh, to say even ahead. the even the fact that like there was that famous commercial from the 70s the don't litter anti-littering commercial that showed a native american but that was oh, actually yeah. a, an italian you know yeah. actor playing it and so like i can see where it's like okay there's 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 places where this is really messed up. And then there's places where it's like, well, it's acting. So like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So like that, that, that for me has been, been mixed up. And I've been thinking about this when I think about, mm -hmm. you know, well, you know, should a, a cis person be able to play a trans character, et cetera, you know, mm -hmm. where, you know, certainly we'd let a trans actor play a, a, a cis character if they wanted to. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, so like, yeah, I don't know. What, what, what are your thoughts on all of that? Well, my thoughts are uh, with any minority group, it's already hard to get a job. Right. You know? And so that's when we start talking about uh, the privileges that certain straight right. actors will have right. in being able to play whatever role they want. Right. And basically when, when they're embodying a role, they are in essence, they're in essence, in their acting, they're essentially uh, playing that up based off of how they feel it is right as opposed to necessarily the actual lived experiences right. of what it would be like to have lived this entire time right. in a certain role you know yeah yeah like no, uh, a lot of people had a problem with uh say scarlett johansson recently okay um mostly because her career is like littered with these little roles uh in which she has played some form of minority character and it's just kind of like we could have brought in any number of people who accurately represented that as an actor like there was a controversy where she was uh supposed to be playing a uh, a trans male uh from history and people right. are like why don't you just give that acting job to a trans male why why do you have to have Scarlett Johansson put on a fat suit and, you know, go through all this rigmarole when you could just hire somebody who knows what it's like? Right, right. And you in know? that case, that's probably because because Scarlett Johansson is going to bring people in. I mean, I mean, because of the box office value she has. It's so that's, money. Yeah. It's money. Yeah, yeah, that's what's going Once again, on again, capitalism is why we can't have nice things. Right, right. No, and, and you're also answering the question of, of how it's entirely different, you know, for gay people to play straight people, because obviously that's the minority playing the majority. So that's like, mm -hmm. yeah. And also, I think that most, you know, gay, queer people also um, have an understanding of straight culture 
from having grown up in it and having it shoved down their throats their whole lives. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, so it's exactly. different. It, it, there's the, all, there's all of that to draw on to imagine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely I used what to it's joke like. about it. Uh, I wasn't as aware of the reasoning behind why I was joking about it, but uh, you know, before I had came out, I was essentially perceived of as just being a straight male. Right. And uh, so I would uh, jokingly uh, blow that out of proportion and then basically uh, create a mockery of uh, how, right. uh, how cis men are presented and uh, specifically white ones <laughs> uh, right. because of language structure, how we present ourselves, things that are like unintentionally offensive. I mean, I was wholesome about it, where I was just like, no, I'm just going to accentuate every single syllable right. and not use slang at all. And right. uh, then it became this running joke. Uh, but it's just like, that is kind of a thing where it's just like, if you're looking at a society that is constantly telling you that you can only acceptably be this way, right? then you have to build in like a few defense mechanisms and learn how to blend in with society. You know, like I said, with Ian McKellen, it's just like, yeah, he came out as gay very late in life, but also brought to the point, it's acting, it's wearing a costume for the sake of other people. And that's why I think it's so fundamentally uh, game changing when someone comes out as trans or comes out as gay, because it's just kind of like, I have been told to behave this way. I'm going to stop that now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, that is not accurate. I'm going to be this way. Thank you. Right. 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 And, and it's, an, of course, an entirely uh, separate issue and only a matter of taste that, for example, I've really enjoyed, you know, uh, the fact that like Joseph Gordon Levitt played a, a, a gay hustler in a movie and I got to see that. I know. I, <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> right. Right. Or River Phoenix. Oh, my God. I had the biggest crush on River Phoenix when I was young because of my mm-hmm. own private Idaho. Right. You know? Yeah. Like, Oh my gosh, you know, and so I don't know, was he, was he bi or was he just straight or I don't even know, but. I don't know. Um, I, well, personally, I actually don't know very much about celebrities, you right. know, like right. full confession, full confession, right. <laughs> like people can rattle those off, no problem. And I'm just kind of like, huh, what do they do in their personal life? Wait, uh, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, It was quite a long time ago that he died at this point. Oh, too. sure. Uh, mid, no, late 90s. 99, mm-hmm. 2000, something like that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've had, uh, I've had similar uh, questions, thoughts, and feelings about Sigourney Weaver ever since <laughs> I was old enough to pay attention. Of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, goodness, you're amazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Yep. <laughs> cool. Well, that kind of got through the, the set of questions or, or topics that, that I had, you know, mm-hmm. and we've also been running about an hour, which is about the length I usually run. So I don't know, is there uh, some way that maybe you wanted to wrap this up or sum it up or did we hit, is there something we didn't hit that you want to hit? And then also, uh, are there places that people can go that are good places to go for like overviews on this or to have questions answered instead of a random Google search, you know? There's that. Um, you wouldn't necessarily uh, get too terribly far on Google searches alone, um, but what comes, uh, what does become a little bit more uh, useful is uh, familiarizing oneself with terminology, and uh, that's as easy as entering in a couple of search terms. And uh, like people have made infographics galore. Okay. And so just looking at all imagery that is associated with various tags, such as trans or 101 or gender and sex, and then like looking for infographics, that's a great way to start off at first. Okay. I actually had to send a few of those to uh, relatives mm-hmm. uh, when I first came out, mostly because right. they were like, well, we love you. We just don't know what this is about. Uh-huh. Sure. <laughs> and I was kind of like, yeah, I'll fire off some stuff. But at the same time, it's just like, on one hand, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily want to make myself, you know, the individual that you can go to, to talk about this subject only because I am a vast wealth of knowledge. Right. It's just right. like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just as uh, psychologically here as everybody else can be. Uh, right. <laughs> I do happen to know a lot, but I'm not very, you know, I can be a teacher, but it's not in my blood, you know? Right. But uh, there are a lot of resources out there. 
Uh, I don't have any in particular to offer. Um, what was your first question? Oh, just if there was anything that we hadn't hit that, that's, in, that, mm. that, that's important that you feel like we needed to, to include. Well, I don't really have any specific uh, trans related things, but like an overview that I would give is that uh, time is only gonna be moving in one direction uh, mm -hmm. as far as we can tell. And uh, the world only gets more complicated. And uh, I think that people need to eventually come to terms with the fact that life is going to get more complicated, not less. And that means how we define ourselves. And uh, I think it's important to occasionally ask the question, what makes us human? You right. know, is it a rigid set of rules or is it our adaptability right. to new situations and new information? Right. And uh, I think adapting is uh, really what should be on the forecast. Right, right. Yeah, and, and I think one thing I would add to that uh, on the topic of things becoming more complicated and all that is that I was talking about these issues, issues with one of my best friends from college, um, you know, so we're the same age, you know, we're both early 50s, you know, a, a mm -hmm. couple of years ago. And um, he had been educated about a lot of these things by his own daughter, you know, and, you know, so this was, this was interesting to hear, you know, to have this mm -hmm. conversation and, and to talk about, you know, how he'd been educated and this and that. And one thing that we brought out of the conversation that I thought was good for other people to hear was that we both uh, felt that it wasn't important uh, that we understand everything in order to accept it. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so, so it's not important, you know, that we mm -hmm. totally get it or can re explain no. it or whatever to, to just be like, yes, I accept this. I accept that this person as they're presenting themselves. I accept that this mm -hmm. is how things are, that, that these are, this is how things are going and this is how things are changing, you know, and mm -hmm. necessary. I can try to imagine, you know, uh, what it was like, you know, for my parents to, be having trouble understanding some of these things in the late sixties, early seventies or, or whatever, when they first came out of there and be like, yeah, that's what I would want them to, to have, to have done at that point is to just mm. be like, okay. Even if I don't understand this, I can still accept it. Exactly. And yeah, that's, that's the thing. There's a bunch of things around this planet that I don't understand either because I don't want to, or I haven't been exposed in such a way that it actually I get it, right? you know? Right. And that's okay. I will get right. to those subjects as they feel to be important, you know? But when it comes to uh, trans and other minority folks, it's just like, I think it's, uh, I think it's kind of a, uh, in, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a thing where we should be more respectful of human beings in the world anyway. Right. And so with a subject like this, it's not the same as, uh, necessarily saying that you can't or shouldn't um like continue i guess basically i'm just gonna round it out with uh we should always continue learning even though we're not gonna get it all you right. know it's just like you're never gonna read all of the books you're never gonna watch all of the shows and movies it's just not going to happen we're only here for a limited time only so keep learning right i like that Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.